Hello. Welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of deal making. Now I want to give you a brief introduction to tell you what this presentation does and does not include. Specifically this topic deal making to me is going to cover mostly things like mergers and acquisitions and also things like partnerships or joint ventures. It is not necessarily going to cover things like having a deal with your customer to essentially a sales deal. If that's what you're looking for, I would refer you to my sales strategy presentation or my negotiation presentation. Likewise, if it's about buying from a supplier, I would refer you to my supply chain presentation or my, again, my negotiation presentation. So those are the things that we're really not going to cover under the deal making, although I cover them elsewhere. Also, there are certain things that I can include in a live presentation that I'm not going to include in the sample here just because it's a sample and I have on, only so many things that I can cover, but I want to make clear that I can cover them if they're relevant to your audience. One of those is going public. Uh, if you're trying if a deal about uh, issuing stock and initial public offering, uh, I would refer you to my family business, private business, and public business uh, presentation. The comparison there, I talk about um, going public. Also, things like bankruptcy, financial distress, debt restructuring. I have a lot of material on that that I can cover under deal making, but because it's a bit of a niche issue, I'm not going to cover it here in my general sample. And lastly, I can talk a lot about the structural, the structure of deals, the mechanics, things like screening for deals, valuations, uh, concepts like seller financing, earnouts, go shop provisions, uh, certain strategies with their nicknames like bear hugs, white knights, Lady Macbeths, but they're a little mechanical and I'm going to stick a little bit more in my sample as I usually do to um, some of the things that I think are a little more original uh, in terms of what I bring to the table. So I can talk about those subjects, but uh, not, they're not going to be included here in the sample. Bear that in mind. So with that in mind, let's get started. Let's dive right into it uh, some, with some of the considerations that you should make when you're evaluating a deal. Um, one of them is the currency that the deal is in. Uh, one of, and that can literally mean the foreign exchange kind of currency, uh, which what are you, if you're issuing debt to uh, make it, to finance a transaction, you can uh, th consider how much, uh, what, what currency that that will be in, especially if it's a foreign entity. Also, if you're repatriating the profits, you hope to um, make money by repatriating, you might want to consider the foreign exchange because that can have a big effect on it if you're dealing with an, uh, a, a business doing a deal uh, cross borders. But even more in currency, one of the things I want to talk about, it's not necessarily foreign exchange currency. It can also be cash or stock because a lot of transactions are all cash, all stock, a mix of cash and stock. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Warren Buffett is uh, fond of pointing out that if you ask a CEO uh, what their stock is worth, they'll typically tell you it's undervalued. Now, some of this is just perhaps salesmanship, but it's important to note that if you are financing a transaction with, sto by, with stock, uh, stock is the currency or part of the currency of that transaction and it's undervalued like let's say your stock is undervalued by 20 percent but you use it to buy another company effectively you're overpaying by about 20 percent as well so that's something to bear in mind don't finance transactions with undervalued stock however you should want and, and conversely if you're buy if you're selling you would love to have the sale financed in undervalued stock because you got not just the price but the bonus of the valuation if it when it returns to uh, an accurate valuation now the other side of that is the AOL Time Warner merger where AOL purchased essentially the the purchase financed essentially the purchase of Time Warner with dot com boom stock which was generally overvalued and there are some people myself included who think that the real purpose of that transaction was to monetize an overvalued stock because they knew it was wasn't worth that much and so they thought well let's just sell it to the time warner shareholders and they'll give us real assets with real value and so you don't want to be on that end of the transaction well it depends if you're aol that's a great deal if you're time warner you want to avoid that so that's something to bear in mind second of all let's talk about Commitment. Now, typically you think that the deal isn't a deal until you sign on the dotted line, but it's important to note a lot of savvy deal makers will try and get you to sort of commit with increasing graduate, uh, increasing uh, levels uh, before you're necessarily ready and then to sort of uh, maybe in the terms uh, get you there. So, for example, if, if you make a public statement, if you announce that a deal is expected, even if you haven't signed on it, it's much more difficult to, uh, it's sort of embarrassing, you lose face 
by having to turn away. And so that can oftentimes make you more likely to take a worse and worse deal. So oftentimes you'll get sort of a memorandum of understanding uh, and sometimes they're a bit op open-ended. And then as you get into the details, people know that because you've already committed publicly to it, uh, that they can, they can ratchet that up with increasingly difficult uh, concessions, uh, sort of the devils in the detail. Um, also, it's important to point out that even if it's not public, you might be have sold it to your board of directors and that they can lose uh, faith in you if you have to back out saying, well, it wasn't as good a deal as I turned out. So bear in mind the level of commitment and the timing of your commitment. Another example of this is the sort of too big or too, too big to fail. I also say sometimes too far to fail. If you go down a road and you've uh, with, uh, with a partner or potentially for a transaction or even if it's just a contract uh, with, a, with a supplier or, a, or a, a customer and it gets sort of so far along, sometimes people will give you what looks like a good deal to begin with knowing that as you get halfway through it, they can change all the terms on you and it will be sort of too big for you to back out at that point. You have some legal responsibilities, some breakup fees are common in that and that is uh, something you want to bear in mind. So, so bear in mind that the commitment is not always, uh, sometimes it's political, it's not just at face value, it's just not just contractual. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, sort of an example of who's doing who the favor. You always want to make sure that you are being compensated for whatever you're bringing to the table. My example for this is I was uh, on the board of a, a book retailer and there was a, this was sort of a, at the advent of online book selling and there was a bookseller that said, why don't you invest in us and hire us to sell your books? And what my argument to them was, look, we're an established book retailer, you're an aspirant in this field, so you should actually be giving us equity because we are putting you in business. We have more benefit to you than you have to us, so we're not really, you know, why should we pay you anything premium? So uh, I, I lost that discussion, by the way, but I, think, I still think that was the, the right attitude. So you always want to make sure, you know, everybody will always come to you with a deal with like, I'm going to do you the favor, and you need to recognize oftentimes they're just coming to you because they want you to do them the favor. Lastly, under considerations, I want to talk a little bit about the alternatives. Deals are very expensive and uh, oftentimes fail. I'll get to that in a moment. And so what you want to make sure is uh, you've considered all the potentially less costly or even less risky alternatives because deals tend to involve assuming a great deal of risk, especially if you're the buyer. Um, I should also note, just as an aside, I, I talk sometimes about being the buyer and, and things you want to avoid, but it's also important to bear in mind that if you're the seller, the opposite might be the case. You might want to get people to commit too soon if it's to your benefit. Um, so anyway, back to what I was saying. Alternatives, um, you might be able to partner with them rather than uh, have a, a, an acquisition or a merger, just have, have a partnership arrangement, maybe a joint venture. It's also important to remember that you might just be able to buy from them or even license their brand. You don't have to own them to use their brand. You might be able to license it uh, contractually. And that's a good example of the AOL Time Warner I talked about earlier. The idea was AOL was buying Time Warner for their media, pro media assets, but the reality is why couldn't AOL have just bought their media, like, you know, rented sort of a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you for the use of your media assets. Um, and then the last one I want to say is, you know, rather than uh, you, people will always come to you when they're in trouble and, and ask for your help in bailing them out, but sometimes it's just easier for them to wait to go bust. Uh, there was an investment firm trying to sell themselves to Warren Buffett and, he said, look, and they said, look, we have all these positions and right now they're undervalued and we're having a cash crunch, buy us and then you'll get the upside. And Warren Buffett cleverly said, what you're basically saying is just go to the market and buy these assets. I don't need to buy you guys for that. Uh, why would I pay you for your equity? And so that was, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's easier to um, just do an alternative to a deal like that. Another good example of that is sometimes if you, there's a company and you like one of their divisions, but they're nearing bankruptcy, wait for them to go bankrupt and then cherry pick the one division you want rather than having to buy the whole company and split them off one at a time. So there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, and that, that can also be um, important in things like a roll-up strategy. Uh, so with that in mind, those are some things that you want to do. Let's talk about some things to avoid. And it's important to note that there are, I've got quite a few uh, pitfalls. I've organized them under various topics. But if you look at the research, most of the, uh, most of the deals, uh, the mergers and acquisitions transactions, fail to uh, at create shareholder value. They're usually net negatives, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. Most deals fail. 
and we want to examine why that is and make sure that we can avoid those pitfalls. Now I always say I'm not anti-deal. There's a lot of great business deals that have been done. I am not a cynic about deals, but I am a skeptic and a certain healthy skepticism is important in light of that research. So first of all, let's talk about some of the logic flaws. Oftentimes people want to buy quote unquote good companies. They're either pro high profit or high growth. But it's important to remember, I always say, the difference between wanting to own and wanting to buy is price. If something is great, it might be overvalued and you still don't want it even though it seems to be a good, solid business. Conversely, you can go the other way and you say, shrinking and money losing businesses you might not want, but at the right price, they might be worth taking. And uh, a good, as, or as sort of to put this in my phrasing, I would say wanting to be rid of and wanting to sell, the difference between wanting to be rid of and wanting to sell is price. And I have a couple examples of that. First of all, um, GE decided that they wanted to be out of the light bulb and appliance business. They decided it wasn't core. And so they went out and tried to sell the divisions and they didn't get a price they wanted. So rationally, they kept those businesses. Um, another thing you might want to bear in mind under logic flaws, these are sort of converse versions of the same thing. This is a variation on that. Um, oftentimes, oh, I also wanted to say on money losing, um, you might say, I don't want, why would you want to buy a money losing business? That doesn't make any sense. Well, in fact, if they pay you to take it off their hands, it can be a good deal. You got to structure that carefully because there's a legal element of uh, what's called consideration. But if you look at the Daimler Chrysler, uh, sale to when Daimler Chrysler sold Chrysler to Cerberus. Supposedly Cerberus bought it for five billion dollars but what really happened is Cerberus basically got it for free and promised to invest five billions of dollars because they thought they could turn it around and make money. Ultimately they didn't on that deal but that is one thing to consider. Also Warren Buffett once bought a shrinking, uh, I think it was an insurance business, some sort of financial services business, and they would say, why would you buy a shrinking business? And his attitude was like, look, the price that they're selling at, I can make money, but you know, eventually we know this business is going to decline to zero, but I can make enough money in over that period that it exceeds the, the valuation, the price. So um, that, that would actually be a good deal. Even though it wasn't a profitable growing business, the price was low enough. So those are some ideas on pricing. Another example of this is we were once, uh, I was a consultant and we were working for a, a firm, uh, a private equity firm that was gonna invest in a business that we thought was unattractive. And we said, look, this isn't, this isn't a very good business. This isn't a profitable or growth business. This is a declining business. And what the private equity seller, seller said to us very wisely, he said, look, I don't buy bad businesses and make them good. I don't buy good businesses and make them great. I buy lousy businesses and make them a little less lousy. And he understood this price. He used a little bit more colorful language than that, but that's another example of um, some of the logic that you should bear in mind. Also, I always want to say these are some sort of sales pitch type of things. Every deal you are ever offered will, be a, will have a good story to it. But as I say, every bad deal in history started with a compelling story. So therefore, Having a good story does not mean that it will be a good deal. It's easy to hear a good story and say, oh, well, that must be a good deal. But you've got to remember, every bad deal had a good story, too. Um, variation of the same thing. Everybody always wants to sell you a deal. Hey, this is a win-win. Oftentimes, it ends up being a win-lose. And unfortunately, sometimes that lose is yours. So under the same kind of logic here, the fact that a deal has a win-win story doesn't make it a good deal because every win-lose story started with a win-win story. And the last thing I wanted to talk about under logic flaws is something called endowment, the endowment effect, which means that when you own something, your, the tendency is to overvalue it versus when someone else has something, the tendency is to undervalue it. So uh, it's, it's important to bear in mind if you're selling, as my grandfather would say, it's only worth what someone will pay for it. Don't get hung up on how overvalued it is. Now there is a qualifier in that. Sometimes there's market timing. As an internal member of that industry, you might know it's worth more than the market's valuing for. But um, don't, don't do it because of the endowment effect. Be self-aware, pardon me, in that regard. Now let's talk about some of the just straight up pitfalls. Uh, these didn't fit neatly in my other top uh, areas, but I wanted to include them. One of them is you always have fraud um, that's not easy to control for, but uh, you, you know, I'm gonna talk about a lot of things here where they'll sort of trick you, but fraud, it's just they just lied to you. And I always like to bear in mind, the more, the more someone tells you how honest they are, my experience, the less honest they are. 
because honest people don't have to constantly tell you how honest they are. They just do what they say and you learn from it. Um, also, you'll notice that if you, if you call people into question, oftentimes they'll, they'll be a bit theatrical with it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about doing business with me. Everybody knows that I'm a reputable person. And that sort of condescending theatrics is meant to sort of bluff you into having faith in them. Um, also, the sort of everybody knows is oftentimes a bluff saying, uh, don't bother asking for references. And it's important to note that even if it's not out and out fraud, sometimes accounting can be uh, ambiguous. And remember, the accountants who prepared these books are usually, in, in the case of ambiguity, they will be biased towards the paying person. So if you're buying a company and they give you their books, the accountants will be biased in favor of them, not you. Um, also, I always like to say, uh, sometimes you run into a problem where you, bidders are supposedly uh, bidding for your business, but they say, hey, maybe we should do a deal. And they're really just after it to get a look at your books. And that, that became an issue in the uh, bankruptcy of a casino here in Las Vegas, a casino company. Their main competitor, uh, they went into bankruptcy and their main competitor wanted to uh, look at acquiring them, told the courts, the bankruptcy courts that they were looking at acquiring them, but the argument became, well, no, 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 they're just looking, they just want to get competitive information. Um, another example, sort of the opposite side of that, is oftentimes sellers are insincere. Sellers are just testing, they, they claim that they're trying to sell their business, but they really just want to see what it's worth on the open market. Maybe they're, you know, doing something, getting a divorce and they want to know how much it's really worth to pay their wife, and so they claim to put it on the market. They also might have uh, a situation where they are um, what else did I want to say about that? Oh, they might be looking for free consulting help. They'll, they'll, they, they want to, if the buyers are potentially good in other industries or smart people, they just want to get their feedback on the business. Um, another pitfall you can have is what's called the winner's curse. Um, typically, you know, the, what a business is worth is its future cash flows. And the, the value, uh, sometimes there are some exceptions to that. It might be the assets, the real estate. But um, there might be... Uh, there's always going to be a certain level of uncertainty uh, about what the actual value is worth. So here's the probability, you know, the probability that it's worth a certain thing. Well, it might be worth a little more, a little less, we don't know. And I put a bell curve here. The problem is in auction situations or bidding situations, when there's multiple bidders, and this is why private equity would rather have an inside deal than a bid deal, uh, the, there's something called the winner's curse, which means the per, the, you know, this, this expectation, different people will think it's in a different location. And the person who ends up bidding the most is usually the person who has most overestimated what it's worth. And so there's a danger of, you know, if you end up winning, uh, that can be bad, uh, that you, you're, the reason you won is because you're the one who miscalculated and is willing to overpay. I saw this happen um, in uh, a lot of uh, local or regional telecom companies bid for uh, Spectrum for this when cellular phones came out and it turns out that most of the people who won were the ones who, these were regional players, cell phones were new, they didn't know how to value it that very well and all the winners ended up going bankrupt. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about management buyouts because the managers tend to know the best and there's a certain problem that you'll run into there. We'll talk about that under people problems. Next thing I want to talk about is um, adverse selection. This is the classic problem of, uh, you know, if it's such a good company, why would they sell it? Uh, and this is the same thing you have with used cars. You know, people only want to sell used cars if they think there's something wrong with them and they, you know, they strap them together with duct tape and bailing wire and hope you won't notice until after you've bought. Same thing could be said of businesses. And uh, so you got to be careful, you know, watch out for the story. They'll have a good story, but it might be that they're selling because it's overvalued. So for example, if I have a business that's uh, been doing really well, but now I see competition entering, I sell the business before competition enters and, and the valuation is based on pro uh, unsustainably high profits. Um, you know, the classic business uh, investment advice is buy low, sell high. And so a lot of people are trying to sell when it's high. Another thing I want to point out under pitfalls is the uh, partnerships and how you value a split. So if you're in a partnership, let's say we have a, a joint venture, um, are you, uh, you want to make sure that you are paid uh, before the expenses of your other partners because oftentimes your partners, and this is especially true when you have a situation where one partner is the managing partner of the business and the other is a silent partner or an investor, the managing partner wants to jack up the costs and allocate all of their overhead to the partnership uh, you know, uh, you like to have private jets, charge it to the business because uh, they have to, you know, if, it's, if it goes to the profit, they have to split it, let's say 50-50 with their partners. But if it's in expenses, they get to keep it all. 
you know, if they can charge their lifestyle to the business, they get all of that money before because it's an expense and it happens before uh, it's calculated before the profits. I have a couple examples of these, such as um, uh, the movie industry used to work this way. They used to promise to pay actors a percentage of the profits, but then the studio would allocate all of their overhead to their uh, to the profitable. Um, movies and not to the flops and so even if you uh, had a big hit movie you would end up not getting paid much because the profits were uh, the, after the expenses. Another good example of that is there's a ho uh, casino hotel company here that has some investment sort of partnerships uh, but they managed the hotels for the investors and the investors realized and some of them were cut fully owned by the managing partner and some of them were split with investors and the investors realized that they were charging more expenses for managing to the partnerships than for their wholly owned because they were trying to jack up the rates on that. And so let's move on to my last pitfall here. That is the option value. A lot of times when you're doing a deal, people will try and put so much into the terms, uh, the term sheets of the deal that they, uh, that, that they're actually not, you know, they'll make it contingent. Well, if the, like I said about earlier, in response to their concern that the profits will go down or that they're overpaying, they'll vest in it over time and they'll have lots of options to get out or get some of their money back. And if you get too aggressive in that defense, you can end up in a situation where you're not even really buying the business. You're almost just effectively buying an option on the business. And if you're a uh, seller, you want to avoid that. Of course, if you're a buyer, that's a great idea. You want to underpay for an option. So those are some pitfalls. Now let's talk a little bit about the people elements of deals. There are several sort of, I, I label these sort of egotistical uh, elements that we want to we want to be clear of. And these can be, um, issues with either the owner of the business or oftentimes their executive staff. If you're a public company, the executives might have some uh, incentives that are in, imperfectly aligned. I'll get to that momentarily. But one of them is oftentimes people just want to build an empire. More is better. Um, another reason is people tend, some people have a te real tendency, they like to be in control. They, they're control freaks. So they want to buy more businesses and have more control over the industry. Another thing is people tend to want to be leaders versus followers. This is an oftentimes a, a sales pitch that you will get from your uh, investment advisors. We'll get to them in a moment. Hey, do you want to lead or do you want to follow? And that's near to hunter versus prey. Uh, people would prefer, if, if there's a consolidating industry, people prefer to be the hunter rather than being the prey. They want to be the buyer rather than the seller because then they get to maintain control and, and own the empire. And it's important to note these kind of depend on, um, like I said, that can be the investor or the executive. I think that's all I had to say on that. Oh, I wanted to mention uh, Bruce Wasserstein, a famous Wall Street deal maker, used to prey on sort of executive and investors' um, impulses here. He used to give a speech that, that colloquially became known as the dare to be great speech. He would give this sort of inspirational, don't you want to be a leader? Let's change the world. Dare to be great. And, and it would sort of appeal to people's sort of egotistical desires. And he got people to put a lot of money into deals that perhaps they shouldn't have. Um, another thing you want to bear in mind is Warren Buffett's old advice. Uh, it's not possible to have a good contract with bad people. That means even if you're worried about a lot of these uh, fraud or pitfalls, you're being snookered, you so you write it into the contract. Oftentimes, bad people will figure out a way to take advantage of you anyway. Warren Buffett says it's not really possible to do a deal with bad people and uh, force their behavior through contractual terms. They're always figuring out something. It's best to just deal with up upstanding people. Um, another thing you want to bear in mind is your in, uh, are your advisor incentives perfectly aligned with you? Oftentimes advisors are paid based on a percentage of the deal or they get more hours if a deal goes through and in those two cases they're more prone to uh, interpret ambiguity around a deal as positive because they they really get paid more there's more money on the line for them to go for a deal and the same thing with executives sometimes their incentives aren't perfectly aligned with investors and we've already talked about some of the ego things those can be executives or investors um, but oftentimes they're vest they're trying to cash out um, sometimes there are provisions that say if in their contracts that say if there's a buyout they vest immediately and if the stock is high they might want to do a deal to vest immediately before it drops and as an investor, that might actually be aligned with you, but if it's a family business, you might be less concerned with the market timing, less concerned than they are. Also, you have an issue of, uh, you know, if they decide to retire, uh, they might want to sell the business 
uh, just so that they can cash out. And then the last one is oftentimes some of the uh, private equity deals, the management buyouts, um, the executives uh, have an advantage there against the other bidders. So they'll always want to buy the company uh, when it's undervalued. Uh, except that so sometimes you'll have something like a go shop provision where you're allowed to go look for other bidders but private equity will always other bidders will be hesitant to go against the to bid against an executive team because the executive should have better information and like we said they, they'll be afraid that they're they'll fall for the winner's curse they won't be able to outbid the executives because they know what it's worth or if they do outbid the executives they know that they're overpaying so as a result you don't you know oftentimes with a ghost shop provision you really don't get a lot of good deals so those are some examples of deal making I got a lot more on this in a live presentation I hope you found this interesting if you'd like to see something like this presented to your organization or event please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal thank you I look forward to doing business with you